Um, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to our panelists across the globe, because I know some of our panelists here each morning where they are. Karibuni sana to this uh, session, Bienvenue to Le Monde. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this webinar because it is one of a kind. My name is Angela Munga Mwadumbo. I am the chair lady of the East Africa Law Society Women Lawyers Committee. And uh, courtesy of the East African Law Society and a partnership between the ELS and the ISLP. This is the International Senior Lawyers Project. We have a very eminent panel of speakers today. Um, this webinar has been made possible, as I have said, through the collaboration of the ELS. As we all know, the East African Law Society is the premier uh, regional bar association that is composed of seven countries, and we have a membership of around um, 30,000 members. The International Senior Lawyers uh, Project is an international organization that offers uh, pro bono legal assistance to governments, uh, to civil society organizations, and even to social organizations. So the role of ISLP, um, how they do their work is that they have uh, volunteers who are legal experts and they provide advice and gu guidance depending on the various uh, clients' needs. And uh, the assistance that is offered by ILSP, ISLP is meant to complement and uh, support the client, that whether the client is a country, a civil society organization, or a social organization. So their role is not to replace um, local legal expertise. So with that, uh, and knowing the topic that we have ahead of us, I am very excited to welcome uh, our moderator for today, that is uh, Miss uh, Glory, who will uh, take us through the session and introduce the speakers. So my role here was just to welcome you all. I can see we have uh, around uh, 80 participants. The rest will join us along the way. So I will hand over to Glory to um, introduce the speakers and uh, set the ball rolling. Karibuni sana and Glory, over to you. Thank you very much, Angela, for your kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Glory Kinyua from the International Senior Lawyers Project. I'm happy to welcome you to our today's webinar on an insider's introduction to international commercial arbitration in East Africa and beyond. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like us to cover a few housekeeping topics. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on different ELS social media platforms. Um, we welcome you to revisit the recording and share with your colleagues who are not able to attend to today's webinar. We also invite your comments and questions. Please use the Q&A chat box or the chat box itself. And if you wish your question to be addressed by a particular speaker, kindly indicate so. We strongly encourage you to share with us your comments and questions for an engaged webinar. Um, I'll now go to introduce our speakers. We are joined by a team of four speakers, three partners from White and Case, and one partner from ELN, who will be sharing uh, regional insight and perspectives on different topics that will be presented. Um, Ank Santen is a partner in White and Case International Arbitration Group based in New York. She serves as counsel or arbitrator in commercial investment and construction arbitrations throughout the world. Ank regularly advises on the drafting of dispute resolution clauses in international contracts. She is the chief editor of the CPR Corporate Counsel Manual for Cross-Border Dispute Resolution, a practical manual for in-house counsel about drafting of international dispute resolution clauses and managing the resulting disputes. Among other roles, 
Ank is the chair of the Foundation for International Arbitration Advocacy, a court member of the London Court of International Arbitration, a member of the Executive Committee of the Institute for Transnational Arbitration, and a member of the Board of the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution, DELOS Dispute Resolution, and the New York International Arbitration Center. Ank advised both Haiti and Ethiopia on the arbitration legislations. She obtained her law degrees from KU Leuven in, in Belgium and Columbia University in New York. She is both qualified in New York and a solicitor of England and Wales. She is fluent in English, Spanish, French, and Dutch. Welcome, Ank Santens. Our next speaker is Aisha Abdallah. Aisha is a partner at ALN Kenya, where she heads the Regional Dispute Resolution Department based at the Nairobi head office. She is dual qualified as an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and a solicitor of England and Wales. Aisha has substance, substantial experience in complex high value cross border disputes. Aisha was nominated by the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce to the board of Nairobi Center for International Arbitration in 2021. In December 2022, Aisha was appointed head of the governing council of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center and is a member of the proceeding committee. She's also at, on the AFCA panel of arbitrators and is a member of the African Users Group for the Singapore International Arbitration Center, the African Arbitration Association, and the DLOS Board of Advisors, among other bodies. Aisha is passionate about the rule of law and impact of quality training. She is a director of the ALN Academy, a charity that provides legal training and capacity building to public and private sector lawyers on the continent. Aisha is rated and recognized by both Chambers Global and Legal 500 for her work. She's the first female and second African lawyer to be ad admitted to the International Association for Defense Council, an invitation-only group of distinguished litigation counsel. Welcome, Aisha Abdallah. Our, our next speaker will be Jennifer Glasser. Jennifer is a partner at the White End Case based in New York and a member of the firm's top ranked international arbitration group. Jennifer represents corporates and sovereign clients across the globe in international commercial arbitration and investment treaty arbitration. Jennifer's experience extends to all major arbitral rules and a wide range of industries with a particular focus on disputes in the power sector. Jennifer is the co-editor of the CPR Corporate Council Manual for Cross-Border Dispute Resolution. She currently chairs the Arbitration Committee for the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution and serves on the CPR Advisory Council Cybersecurity Task Force and Task Force on Virtual Hearings. She recently served on a task force of the International Council for Commercial Arbitration that published guidelines on standards of practice in international arbitration. Last but not least, we are joined by Zelda Hunter. Zelda is a partner in White and Case Geneva office. She is a Zimbabwean, but studied in South Africa and later the UK. Her practice focuses on international commercial arbitration, specifically on disputes arising out of big infrastructure projects, whether big construction, power, or energy as well as disputes in the mining and technology sectors. Zelda has undertaken a, a lot of award enforcement related work and currently serving as co-chair of the IBA recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards subcommittee. As you can see, we have a very able team of experts. Um, now we'll proceed with our Ebna. Um, I'll welcome Jennifer Glacier to start us off. Jennifer, the floor is yours, welcome. Thanks very much, Glory. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Is everyone able to see the slides? Yes, we can see the slides. We can. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you again for having us today. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, with the East Africa Law Society Women's Law Committee, and I'm grateful to Angela and Lori and the ISLP team for organizing this event today. 
Our topic, as you've already heard, is an insider's introduction to international arbitration in East Africa and beyond. We've broken up our presentation today into four parts. Um, I will kick us off by covering what is international commercial arbitration and why use it, what are its advantages and some of its disadvantages. Then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ang Santins, who will cover drafting effective international arbitration clauses. Next, my colleague Zelda Hunter will cover diversity in international arbitration and review some tips to develop a successful practice in the field of international arbitration. And then finally, Aisha will close us off with commercial arbitrands in East Africa. Uh, to the extent that you have any questions or comments, please do feel free to share them in the comment box. Uh, any small comments that relate to, to particular sections we'll try to cover as we go through each piece, and then we'll have a dedicated Q&A section at the end. What is international commercial arbitration and why use it? International commercial arbitration is a form of private dispute resolution between parties from different countries that is grounded in contract. So the parties to a commercial contract will insert into their claw, into their contract an arbitration agreement, providing that any disputes under that contract or in relation to it will be resolved by arbitration as opposed to litigation before a national court system. Now, th this slide shows the growing popularity of international arbitration. Um, we've captured here the period between 2003 and 2020. And as you can see, there has been uh, a marked uptick in international arbitration over the past two decades or so. Now, a couple notable data points to draw your attention to. And I'm just getting a comment from my colleague that you're not seeing the full screen. So we wanna make sure. That Click that. from current slide, Jennifer, the second button. Second, yeah, I think yeah. that should make it a slideshow. Yeah. I... Are you seeing it? Is it a slideshow? No. no, but it's okay, we can see it the way yeah. it is. Yeah, okay. Um, so a couple notable data points here on the growing popularity of international arbitration. We've listed both the major international arbitration institutions, which you'll hear more about shortly from Ankh. And we've also included a couple examples of regional African institutions, which Aisha and Ankh will also comment on. Now the trend in, in both the international and the regional institutions is an increase but the volume of cases remains much higher at the international level. So at the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, which is one of the most well-known institutions that administers arbitrations, they had 946 new cases that were filed in 2020, um, whereas the Kigali International Arbitration Center had volume in 2020 was, I believe, a 50, 28 cases commenced in 2020. So the volume is much lower at the regional level, but there is an uptick. Um, that number for 2020 at the Kigali Center of 28 cases is an increase from five cases that were commenced in 2013 when it first started administering arbitrations. The other data point that I would note is that we've captured 2020 on the screen here. All of the uh, international institutions reported significant upticks in cases filed in 2020, uh, which was at the height of the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic, case volumes have come down about 20% since 2020 over the past two years. So what, why is it that users are turning to international arbitration with increasing frequency? Why has it become a popular mode of dispute resolution? In the next few slides, I'm going to cover some of the main advantages of international commercial arbitration. The first one is neutrality. Within arbitration, there's no home court advantage 
from either party. As I mentioned at the outset, arbitration is a creature of contract, uh, where you have a contract with a party from country A, a party from country B, and they elect to resolve their disputes in a neutral forum. Another major benefit of international commercial arbitration is enforceability. The outcome of that dispute resolution process will be an arbitral award. Now, there is an international convention, a treaty, called the uh, 1958 Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, or the New York Convention. And that international treaty does two important things in the realm of enforcement. It requires contracting states to give effect to private arbitration agreements. And it requires contracting states to recognize and enforce arbitral awards, the ultimate decision of the arbitral tribunal, in the same way as that contracting state would enforce a national court judgment. It's intended to provide for speedy enforcement of awards with limited review of awards on the merits. So there is no appeal. It provides for swift enforcement of awards. And that's a major benefit because there is no similar global international treaty that provides for the enforcement of national court judgments. This slide shows you uh, just how powerful the reach of the New York Convention is. There's over 160 state parties to the New York Convention today. And as you can see on the slide, um, nearly all of the member states of the East Africa Law Society uh, are members of the New York Convention. The New York Convention is in force in Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, the only uh, East Africa Law Society member who has not signed the New York Convention is South Sudan. Turning to the next advantage of international arbitration, privacy. This is one that is repeatedly noted in surveys by in-house counsel as being uh, one of the predominant benefits of international arbitration rather than resolving your business disputes in a public court battle international arbitration proceedings are private there's no public court proceedings there's no public record at the time of the arbitration of the award and the various decisions now I need to pause here because there is a distinction between privacy and confidentiality. And there's a bit of a, a, a misnomer in some circles that arbitration is a completely confidential process. And one is not able to make documents from the arbitration publicly available. That is false. The confidentiality regime will ultimately be decided by the institutional arbitration rules that the parties choose, which I will cover in a moment when she comes to clause drafting. Some of them provide for arbitration to be confidential, and uh, most of them expressly require that the work of an arbitral institution that administers an arbitration must be confidential. But um, many of them do not specifically provide that the arbitration itself is confidential. And it's important to be aware of while the proceedings are ongoing, they are private. But when you move to enforce an arbitral award, and if you have to file papers before a national court in order to enforce that award under the New York Convention, the arbitration award often becomes public as a result of that filing. Now, of course, that will depend on the national court system where you are seeking to enforce your award. 
It is the case in the United States that filings are by default publicly available, and it is an uphill battle in order to seal the record and to seal an arbitration award. Now, in addition to the institutional arbitration rules, uh, many of which address confidentiality, there are also mechanisms for the parties to address confidentiality themselves, whether it be in an arbitration clause, which Ankh will cover in a moment, and then, of course, by seeking an order from the arbitral tribunal. Turning to the next advantage of international commercial arbitration, that is the ability to choose your adjudicators. Arbitrator selection is one of the most important aspects of a case. That is both selecting individuals who have the requisite expertise to decide a particular dispute. And typically, uh, in major arbitrations, you appear before a panel of three tribunal members. And so it's not just a question of choosing one individual with the right profile for your um, arbitration, but also taking into account the um, politics and cultural dynamics of an arbitration tribunal and ensuring that you constitute the right tribunal to reach your client's results. Now, the slide says, and, and this is a very important point, that the selection strategy should be tailored to the case strategy. And so if you are a party advocate and you have a case where uh, your view requires a strict interpretation of the contract, one would want to look for an individual who leans towards strict contract interpretation, who is less minded to uh, read a contract broadly based on the equities as just one example. Now, another key advantage that's already come up uh, a few times in the slides is flexible procedures. Arbitrators have wide discretion to tailor procedures based on the dispute at hand and party preference. We'll look at a moment at one of the more typical frameworks of an international arbitration and the key procedural milestones. Now, there's two points that I wanted to mention here in respect of procedures. Early disposition procedures are included under major international arbitration rules and may be a creative way to save time and costs. The purpose of an early disposition procedure is to bifurcate uh, a particular issue. Uh, it may be a time bar defense that a particular claim is barred because the statute of limitations has already run, for example. And if that were a dispositive defense, one could make an application to a tribunal to have that defense heard separately of the merits of the case in an expedited initial phase, which would avoid the costs of litigating the full dispute on the merits and a lengthy arbitration of one to two years, if not more. Early disposition procedures um, may also be used, for example, in defenses of res judicata, that a claim has already been brought and decided in a previous case, and so the claimant is collaterally stopped from relitigating it. And other ways to bifurcate the procedure creatively may be to bifurcate the merits of a case from the damages. Um, in a very complex case, that can sometimes lead to cost savings, and it may be that the parties are able to reach an amicable resolution after a decision is issued on the merits and avoids the costs of a, an expensive and lengthy phase on damages. The last procedural point to note is that emergency relief is available in international arbitration, and there's typically two avenues to avail yourself of emergency relief. The first is that uh, nearly all of the major international arbitration rules provide for emergency arbitrator procedures. Those allow you to uh, have interim relief put into place very quickly before the arbitral tribunal who will decide the merits 
has been constituted. Typically, the institution appoints an emergency arbitrator. Uh, the parties make very expedited written submissions. A short teleconference hearing is held, and it's possible to have interim relief put in place within, uh, I think it's two weeks is the average timeline at the ICC for an emergency arbitration proceeding. Now, the other avenue to seek emergency relief is interim relief from courts at the seat of arbitration and elsewhere. Uh, it's important to check the institutional arbitration rules that apply to your given case if you're using institutional arbitration, um, which typically have a provision saying that you can obtain interim relief from the courts uh, before the tribunal is constituted and in some cases after. Now, turning to the arbitration procedure in practice, on the screen, and I don't love this slide because I'm getting older and I'm slightly blind and have trouble seeing it myself, um, but here you see a, a map of a typical ICC arbitration procedure, and this frankly makes it look more complicated than it is. Let me highlight just a few points about what the anatomy of an arbitration looks like. It, it typically kicks off with a round of um, very initial pleadings between the parties, a complaint uh, or request for arbitration where the party sets out at a high level the basis for claims and an answer to that complaint. There's then a brief phase where the tribunal is constituted, uh, and that, of course, is critical, as I mentioned before. Typically, um, each side will select an arbitrator if it's a three member panel and uh, the arbitrators uh, and or the parties themselves will seek to jointly reach agreement on the chair with an institution to appoint the chair if no agreement is reached. Then we reach the merits phase of an arbitration, and this is where there is some significant differences, at least with respect to US court litigation. Much of arbitration is done in writing with significantly shorter hearings than one sees in a US court litigation. So typically there'll be two rounds of written plenary submissions by the parties where the parties put in their case in chief, their defense in chief, together with all documentary exhibits and with witness statements and expert reports. There will be a document production phase wedged somewhere between those pleadings. And then at the end of that written phase, there will be a hearing phase. The hearing may last anywhere from a couple days to two, three weeks or more in a construction arbitration. But uh, a significant difference, as I mentioned, with US court litigation is, is a shorter hearing and more that is done on the papers. We see that, for example, with respect to witness examination in international arbitration. Uh, in the United States, it is very common practice to spend quite a long time uh, putting on your own witness and asking direct examination questions of your own witness that can last hours or days. In international arbitration, that written witness statement stands in lieu of the direct examination of your own witness. And typically, uh, a party advocate will spend just a couple minutes warming up the witness and introducing the witness, and then um, most of the time will be spent on cross-examination by the other side. Following the, the hearing, we then come to the, the final award. Now, in terms of the typical timeline here, we show two years on the slide, and that is consistent with the ICC statistics for 2020, uh, when the average arbitration was running at 24 months. Some of the other international institutions report average times of 12 to 15 months, a bit shorter. And again, I, I must emphasize that this is very much one typical arbitration framework for a big case. There are lots of ways to modify and craft this procedure to suit a particular case. For example, last year I did a case where we cut through the multiple rounds of written submissions and limited it to one round of written submissions by each party and went right to hearing. And with that, we were able to cut down the total arbitration timeline to uh, 14 months from the typical ICC timeline of 24 months. 
Now, turning to, to the last slide in my portion of the presentation, I would not be a, a fair advocate if I only told you about the advantages of arbitration. So on the slide, I've listed a few of the disadvantages of arbitration and also noted some mitigation strategies to address those disadvantages. The first one is that an award cannot be corrected for errors of fact or law. That's of course different than litigation before a national court system uh, where decisions are subject to one or more rounds of appeals. And oftentimes, depending on the particular issue and posture, uh, may be reviewed de novo at the appeal level. Now, it, it, in, in the right case, while uh, appeal and annulments are not standard in international commercial arbitration, it is possible to provide in your arbitration clause at the outset for an appeal type process if that is suited to a particular business context where you are using an arbitration clause. Another disadvantage is that arbitrators lack coercive powers. An arbitrator cannot throw a, a, an uncooperative witness into prison. Uh, a way to, to mitigate the lack of the coercive powers of an arbitrator is to seat an arbitration in a pro-enforcement jurisdiction. Ank and Aisha will, will cover some best practices on, on seat of arbitration in a moment. Another disadvantage is that a tribunal lacks authority over non-signatories, absent an exception under national law that would allow you to bind a non-signatory to an agreement, and potentially also lacks authority over related contracts and parties. There are again ways to address these issues. Many of the institutional rules have been amended in recent years to provide for multi-contract, multi-party arbitration and to provide for the consolidation of related disputes under different contracts. And so if you are in the context of a construction um, uh, dispute, for example, and you, you know at the outset as you are building in your uh, contract chain that you may have a dispute involving multiple parties that you want to resolve together in one forum, you should be mindful at the outset to choose institutional rules that facilitate that multi-party, multi-contract arbitration. And then the final point, uh, which follows from our, our last slide on procedure, is that time does need to be spent organizing the procedure. Um, if you select what I've been referring to as institutional arbitration, uh, each institution does have a set of rules to govern the arbitration process, but the rules are very, very general and say typically that an arbitrator has wide discretion to determine the procedure, consulting the parties, and in a way it deems appropriate. Um, now, so choosing those institutional rules will cut down on the time spent organizing the procedure, as will choosing expert arbitration counsel uh, who is familiar with the procedures uh, and can help craft one that suits the dispute at hand. I'll now turn it over to Ang. Thanks, Jennifer. There's been a comment that the slides are difficult to see. I, I think uh, you okay. might want to unshare for a moment and yeah. put it yeah. on the slideshow and bring it back up. Any better? Yes, that's better. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So okay. will you scroll down? Because I, yeah. I see the title slide now. <clears throat> so uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you after Jennifer has explained what uh, arbitration is. Uh, I will uh, spend some time with you. Uh, giving you some basic tips on drafting effective international arbitration clauses. Uh, I will say the tips are going to be basic and really focus on an arbitration clause in a typical scenario, um, because if I were to cover everything that may need to be said about an arbitration clause, I would need the two hours uh, for that alone. But the, the tips that we will be giving you today work in frankly, 90% of cases. 
Um, and that is because uh, of the advice that you see on this first slide, which is that we recommend that you start from a model clause and that you keep the clause very simple. Uh, all major arbitral institutions have model language on their website that you can draw from. Um, here, for instance, what you see in the black uh, font is the model clause of the ICC, the, the International Court of Arbitration of the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, which is one of the most well-known and mostly used uh, institutions around the world, including for uh, arbitrations involving African parties. Um, there are then two sentences in blue, which we do recommend you add to the ICC model clause. Some model clauses actually do include this language about the seed and the language of the arbitration. The ICC uh, does not, but for reasons that I'll get into in a moment, we do recommend that you add those two sentences. And so this short clause that you see here is really the type of clause that you can have, as I said, in 90% uh, of contracts, nothing more is needed to have an effective arbitration. And we recommend in most scenarios that you don't add more language because adding more language um, gives risks to disputes because the language may not be entirely accurate or it may be confusing or it may be conflicting with language somewhere else. So our strong recommendation is that in the vast majority of cases, your arbitration clause look like this one and, and not more complicated than this one because that's not necessary. If we go to the next slide, um, what do you, I'm now going to explain why what you have in the clause is needed and why you don't really need anything else. So the first important uh, guidance is that you need to clearly and broadly define the disputes that are subject to arbitration. Uh, so you see here on the right uh, of the top box on this slide, what language is necessary to do that. So the, the, what the clause that we looked at in a moment said is all disputes arising out of or in connection with the present contract shall be finally settled under the rules of arbitration of the ICC. So the first piece here, all disputes arising out of or in connection with the present contract is brought, right? It's all disputes that are either arise out of the contract or in connection with the contract shall be settled by arbitration. Uh, and it's important to have both pieces of the arising out of or in connection with. And that is because if you only have the piece arising out of, that has been interpreted by arbitrators and courts as excluding tort claims, for instance, that may arise in connection with a contract. So you have a contract, you, have, you may have a breach of contract claim, you may also have a related claim for negligence or fraud. If you don't have the or in connection with language, those claims may be considered not subject to arbitration because it may be considered that the parties didn't consent to arbitrate those types of claims. So it is important that you have the broad um, language in any arbitration clause so that all the disputes that arise uh, in connection with the project or the, or the, the transaction that is um, the subject of the contract are, are subject to arbitration. The second tip is of course that the reference to arbitration has to be mandatory. So here it says shall be finally settled. It can also say must be finally settled, but it's important that it doesn't say, for instance, may be finally settled, because then that raises a question whether the parties have agreed to arbitration as the exclusive dispute resolution method for their dispute, or whether one may also um, go to court. We can turn to the next slide, Jennifer. Um, the next... Uh, critical element that any arbitration must have is that you must specify where the arbitration, under which rules the arbitration will take place. So if you just say the dispute shall be covered by, uh, governed by arbitration, settled by arbitration, no one knows, well, which arbitration from which institution. So it's important to uh, set that out in the clause because otherwise you may have difficulty getting, you will have difficulty getting an arbitration going. 
Now, there are really two types of arbitration. Jennifer already uh, mentioned it in her presentation. There is institutional arbitration and there or, or administered arbitration, and there is ad hoc or non-administered arbitration. Between those two, we recommend that you choose institutional arbitration for reasons that I will get into, and we can go to the next slide for that. So what, what, are, what is the difference between the two? Uh, institutional arbitration is, is arbitration that is administered by an arbitral institution like the ICC or the Nairobi Center or any center that you have in, 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 in all of the countries that are members of the East, uh, Africa, uh, of the East Africa Law Association. And the, the institution that administers the arbitration provides administrative support for a fee. So it assists, for instance, with the constitution of the tribunal, whether it's appointing arbitrators, deciding on any challenges or replacing arbitrators. And that is really a key feature of institutional arbitration compared to ad hoc arbitration, where if the parties can't uh, agree on the arbitrators, you may need to have to court, which again may cause delays and, and, and make the arbitration much more lengthy and complicated than it would be otherwise. The other value of an institution, having an institution administer your arbitration is that the institution handles all kinds of procedural and administrative issues, uh, like for instance, setting, collecting and paying arbitrator fees. Whereas if you have a non-administered or an ad hoc arbitration, those issues need to be dealt with by the parties between themselves or with the tribunal. And it can be quite awkward, for instance, if you have to negotiate with the tribunal their fee for the arbitration. It's much more comfortable to leave that task to uh, an independent uh, third party, um, an arbitral institution. So while institutional arbitration does come with a fee, the fee is relatively limited uh, when compared to cancel fees in an arbitration. And so it's generally very worthwhile to pay the relatively limited fee to get this service um, in an arbitration. I see I have a, I see a question about the differences between LCIA and ICC. I will come to that in a moment. Uh, we can turn to the next slide. So what do you look for in an, in an arbitral institution? You want a reputable institution that has modern arbitration rules and that has an established record of competently administering international cases when you are dealing with an international dispute, which is, of course, what we're um, covering today. The rules of arbitral institutions, um, certainly of the well-known international ones, are very similar in many respects, but they do differ. And it is important um, that you know about the differences before you choose an arbitral institution. And as I said, there was, for instance, a question before about the differences between the LCIA and the ICC. Um, one difference between those two is that in the LCIA, arbitrators are remunerated based on uh, time spent. So they get an hourly rate an hourly rate which is capped by the LCIA at a certain amount. In ICC arbitration, on the other hand, arbitrators get compensated based on the amount in dispute. Now, in many cases, that may not really make a difference, but in some it may. For instance, if you have a dispute, if you enter into a loan agreement, very often the dispute is just about whether the loan was paid or not, and it's not a very complex dispute. But if it's a very significant loan, the amount in dispute may actually be very high. So that may be a scenario in which you may prefer LCIA arbitration over ICC arbitration, because in the ICC arbitration, even though the case is not complex, the arbitrators may get a, a significant remuneration because the amount in dispute is high. There are other scenarios where it may go the other way, and it may be better to have uh, remuneration based on the amount in dispute. So that is something that for certain contracts may be a relevant consideration, although it's not for all. 
Um, another uh, unique feature of the ICC is that the ICC does something called scrutiny of awards. So when arbitrators um, write an award uh, in an ICC arbitration, they have to submit the draft award to the ICC and the ICC will task uh, someone with reviewing the award and drawing um, potential errors to the attention of the arbitrators, which the arbitrators then have an opportunity to address in the award. Um, now, the LCIA, for instance, and other institutions also have some form of review of an award to make sure that the most basic things are satisfied, such as the names of the arbitrators are there, the award is signed, etc. But the scrutiny feature of the ICC is more in depth than of other institutions, that, and that is something that um, uh, some users find is a big advantage of ICC, other users find is a disadvantage because it takes more time uh, for the ICC to render an award. So there are differences, but among um, the, the reputable institutions, they are often not um, game changing, I would say, and there are a number of institutions that are safe for you to go with in any dispute. So for that, I think we can turn to the next slide. And the only other point that I would add there Ankh, on LCIA versus ICC that came up in my presentation is the confidentiality one. So the LCIA rules um, do expressly provide for the parties um, to undertake to keep all the award and all uh, materials in the arbitration confidential. There is no um, similar rule in the ICC rules. There's no duty or undertaking of the parties uh, to maintain confidentiality. The ICC rules provide for the court, the ICC court and the secretariat to maintain confidentiality. Um, but again, there's no obligation there on the parties. So that's another one to keep in mind. Yeah, and that's actually a deliberate choice of the ICC. And so institutions do make deliberate choices in their rules. And so it is important to, to, to know about them. So here you have um, on the left, uh, a list of well-known and recommended international institutions. As you can see, the ICC and the LCIA are listed up top. Uh, others listed here are the ICDR uh, in the United States, based in New York, CPR, which is also based in New York, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, the Swiss Chambers of, uh, the Swiss Chambers, uh, which provide uh, arbitration services for arbitration for um, in Switzerland and the Stockholm uh, Arbitration Center. These are all, as I said, safe institutions to go with. Um, the, they tend to get chosen because of their regional focus. For instance, Hong Kong and SIAC are often chosen for disputes involving Asian parties. The Swiss chambers are more chosen uh, are, don't really have a regional focus, I would say. They may be chosen for any type of dispute. Stockholm traditionally has focused on East-West disputes, so disputes between European parties and, uh, and either Asian or Russian parties, but they're all capable of administering arbitrations around um, the world. And now I'll turn it over to Aisha for a moment to comment on um, the regional institutions that are uh, listed on the right of the slide. Um, thank, thank you, Ank. Um, thank you, everyone who's gone before me. Um, obviously, if you look at the right of the slide, um, there are a number of regional institutions there, starting from the bottom. There's AFSA based in South Africa. There's um, CMAC in Casablanca, Mauritius. We have CRICA, which is based in Cairo. We have Lagos, Kigali, and Nairobi Center. Um, just focusing on East Africa, Kigali is has the largest number of cases um, and it has um, I think done very well in terms of a newly established center so it has a lot of cases. Um, one of the issues I think they do need to address in terms of attracting more cases from outside um, Rwanda is probably we're not getting jurisprudence from the high courts because I don't believe any um, application to set aside any of the awards has been made. So we don't get um, any case law. And I think uh, we don't have visibility then other than anecdotally being told that the 
the awards are upheld and 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 they are they are they're enforced even against the government. Um, if you look at um, countries like Mauritius, Mauritius had the first um, set aside application a number of years ago for for an award. There is a lot of jurisprudence um, coming out of the Supreme Court of Mauritius, so you do have a lot more visibility around recognition and enforcement. Um, in Kenya, Nairobi Center is relatively new. I think we're into our sixth or seventh year. Um, but Nairobi, um, Kenya traditionally has a very strong domestic arbitration scene, and we do have a number of cases both concerning domestic and foreign awards. So we do have jurisprudence around recognition and enforcement. Um, and essentially, we have a new constitution that says um, courts must promote specifically arbitration, which is named um, amongst other alternative dispute resolution centers. So I think the um, framework is quite solid. I can't speak much about Lagos or Krika or Casablanca. I would think that um, this is because these centers would be serving um, you know, sort of disputes more around their part of the world. I know that Krika is very busy and does a lot of Arab language um, disputes, particularly in the construction sector, which is very active in Egypt. Um, I'm sure Lagos is very busy because Nigeria is a large economy. I can't say much, unfortunately, about um, uh, Casablanca. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of options for people, um, both in terms of just language and culture. So we have civil law um, based institutions. We have common law ones. We have a mixture because Kiak used to be civil law and is now English speaking as well and common law based. So I think there's a lot of choice. And um, actually, you will find that because of the partnerships these regional institutions are creating with international institutions, there is a lot of um, updating of the rules. So NCIA did update the rules during COVID to look at the use of technology and to incorporate some of the newer um, provisions. Um, and I think there is a lot of following a best practice. So I think I think we are very much at the start of a journey, but the trajectory is looking very good. And I just wanted to mention for my Tanzanian colleagues that, of course, the Tanzania Arbitration Center is very new, and we do look forward to seeing um, it operationalizing. And also um, for us, it, it is important to see how the courts are looking at these awards. And for us, it is important to get um, jurisprudence. Thank you. Thanks, Aisha. Um, there's a question in this chat. What are procedures to get access to international arbitration institution and regional ones? So do, there's two ways you, you can get access. One is, as I mentioned, you choose one of these institutions in your arbitration clause. So in the arbitration clause, you will say all disputes arising out of or in connection with this contract shall be settled by arbitration under the rules of the LCIA or the ICC or the KIAC. And so the way to do that is you go onto the website of these institutions and get their model clause and put that into your contract. That's one way. Another way may be that once the dispute has arisen, you may agree with your counterparty to submit a dispute to an arbitral institution. That's more rare because usually when there is a dispute, parties don't agree on much of anything, but it may happen that way as well. Um, and now we can turn to the next uh, slide. So a brief word about ad hoc arbitration. Um, if you do decide not to go for institutional arbitration for, for one reason or another, uh, one may be, for instance, that you're contracting with a state. Some states are, are reluctant to agree to institutional arbitration and may want ad hoc arbitration. If that is the case, we do recommend choosing there also a, a set of ad hoc arbitration rules. The most well-known ad hoc arbitration rules are the UNCITRAL arbitration rules. <clears throat> they have uh, been put together by UNCITRAL, which is a division of the United Nations. The rules are excellent. They are updated every few years and they can make uh, not non-institutional arbitration work quite well. Um, if you do go for ad hoc arbitration, the one critical 
element is that you must appoint an appointing authority for the arbitrators. Because as I mentioned, in ad hoc arbitration, an institution is not going to help you with appointing arbitrators. And so if you don't specify an ad hoc authority, you, may, you will have to go to court if you want arbitrators to be appointed, which is usually not a good idea. Uh, many of the courts don't know the good arbitrators and don't know who to appoint. So if you go for ad hoc arbitration, you should actually appoint an arbitral institution as the appointing authority for the arbitrators so that if in the beginning of the case the parties don't agree on the arbitrators or one doesn't cooperate and doesn't appoint one you can go to an arbitral institution to have a good arbitrator appointed and the way to do that is set out in the slide this provision that you have here is uh, the model clause for the unsatural arbitration rules okay we can move on Next, you have to specify the number of the arbitrators and their method of selection. Uh, on the right, you can see the model language for that in the ICC uh, model clause, which says by one or more arbitrators appointed in accordance with the said rules. Um, the number of arbitrators always has to be uneven, so either one or three. In exceptional cases, five, but I'm not going to get into that. The typical number is one or three. You can see the benefits of both. Uh, one arbitrator is less expensive. One arbitrator may be quicker because he or she can just move on with the case by him or herself. Whereas with three, three people need to be available. Three people need to agree. Three people need to consult. So it takes some more time. It's more expensive, but it is safer. And that is particularly important in arbitration because as Jennifer mentioned, an arbitral award cannot be appealed and cannot be overturned for errors of fact or law. So the arbitrators need to get it right uh, on the first shot. And so if you have a complex important, or if you anticipate that the disputes arising out of this contract will be complex and high stakes, you definitely want to provide for three arbitrators and not one. As to the method of appointment, the arbitral rules typically provide for a method of appointment. Um, and the typical method of appointment is that the claiming party will be allowed to appoint an arbitrator. The responding party will uh, be allowed to appoint an arbitrator. And then together, they have to try to agree on the third and presiding arbitrator when you have three arbitrators. When it's one arbitrator, um, the parties can either agree on the one arbitrator or the institution will appoint the one arbitrator. Typically, the provisions that are in the institutional rules about how arbitrators will be appointed are satisfactory. And so you can just do what the ICC uh, does on its model clause, which is saying that the arbitrators will be appointed in accordance with the rules. Where the rules do not give the parties a right to appoint an arbitrator, we would recommend um, that you do um, uh, change that and give the parties a right to appoint an arbitrator because that's a very important right of parties in an arbitration. We can move to the next slide. Uh, I do see we, we, we have to um, keep moving. So the next uh, essential element is choosing the seat of the arbitration in the arbitration clause. The way to do that is to say the seat of the arbitration shall be Kigali, Nairobi, New York, whatever it is. This is absolutely critical um, because the seat of the arbitration is very important. Um, and we can go to the next slide uh, for that. The seat of the arbitration is important because it is the legal domicile of the arbitration. And as a result, it will determine which arbitration law applies to the arbitration. And the arbitration law, in turn, will govern issues such as, is this dispute arbitrable? Do the arbitrators have the power to grant interim relief? And a host of other issues. So, it, it, so it's, it's critical that you seat an arbitration in a jurisdiction where the arbitration law is in favor of arbitration and is modern and has modern provisions. Secondly, the courts at the seat have supervisory jurisdiction over the arbitration. 
They are the courts that you may have to go to to compel arbitration. They are the courts that provide judicial assistance with things like provisional measures, uh, gathering evidence and all kinds of things. But most importantly, they are the courts where if a party is dissatisfied with an award that may be able to set aside the award. And they are the only courts in the world that are able to set aside the award. So if you have an arbitration seated in Nairobi and, and a party wants to set aside the award, it has to go to the courts in Nairobi to do that. And if the courts in Nairobi do set aside the award, the award is now a nullity. And except for very limited exceptions, you cannot enforce it anywhere else in the world. This is different from if you have an arbitration seated in Nairobi and you now want to enforce it in New York, for instance, the New York courts may decide not to enforce the award, but they cannot annul it. So if you're not successful to enforce an award in New York, you may bring it to another jurisdiction and you may be able to enforce it elsewhere. So the courts of the seat of the arbitration are absolutely critical um, because you may well get an award, but if you got it in a country where the courts of the country are um, biased in favor of the other party, then you may see your award annulled um, for no good reason. And so your whole effort may be uh, undermined. The seat is also what determines the nationality of an arbitration award under the New York Convention. Uh, and it's also typically where the hearings are held, although that is not necessary, you may hold your hearings elsewhere. So this is why the seed is so critical. It really may um, determine whether your award will be um, effective or not, and whether you will able, be able to get to an effective award. So turning to the next slide. Uh, on this slide, I have listed the uh, seats where most international arbitration is seated. And that is for the reasons that I got, uh, have gone into before. All of these locations, Geneva, London, New York, Paris, Stockholm, and Singapore, have a modern arbitration law, have courts that are in favor of arbitration and, and will support arbitration, and have courts that will not uh, annul an award uh, lightly, if at all. Um, and so these are considered safe uh, seats for any arbitration, whether your counterparty is from that jurisdiction or not, you can be uh, sure that you will be fairly treated before the courts. And now I'll turn it over again to Aisha to comment on seats um, in East Africa, which I think are listed on the next slide. Um, thank, thank you, Anne. I think I did um, sort of touch on uh, how these seats are doing relatively. Um, I would say that they are, they are regional, and you will find that the users of those courts tend to be um, closely um, linked to those countries, so it may be construction projects in a specific country, um, and that is uh, as opposed to maybe um, international in reach. One thing I'd say about Mauritius is Mauritius is considered very much a good option when um, other more established or Western seats might be too expensive for the value of the dispute or perhaps too far away or difficult for parties to access. So Mauritius is often seen as a good halfway house for disputes involving Asian and African parties um, uh, and, and it has done quite well in, in that sense. Um, I think the others, um, you know, we, you can, some of them do publish the st statistics on numbers, but I don't think um, any of them are claiming, claiming, for example, to be um, aspiring to cover more than their regions um, or, or trying to do anything pan-African. We actually have um, something like 75 centers in Africa, which exceeds the number of countries in Africa, which is 54, by some margin. So we probably have too many seats, um, and there is a big push to regionalize um, the disputes. Thank you. So th there was a question in the chat, uh, what's the difference between the seat and the location of an arbitration? So the words seat and place of arbitration are um, this mean the same. It means the juridical location of the arbitration. 
um, hearings can, as I said, can take place elsewhere. So you can perfectly have an arbitration seated, so seated in London with the hearing being held in Nairobi. That is perfectly doable. It's not because the legal seat of the arbitration is in London that you also have to travel to London to have hearings. And you can actually specify that in your arbitration clause if that is important to you. Um, one thing that I do think you is it important, important for you to understand is that if you are advising on a contract that has, for instance, a Kenyan party and an, an American party, the American party may well not wish to see the arbitration in Nairobi as a legal matter, but it may wish to uh, hold hearings in Nairobi. And so that may be um, an acceptable compromise between the parties to have the legal seat somewhere else, for instance, in London or in New York or in Paris, but to agree that the hearings will be in Nairobi so that the parties don't have to, um, uh, or the, the Kenyan party doesn't have to engage into the cost of traveling elsewhere for the hearings. That's perfectly acceptable. And I, I would also note on the hearing location question um, that you can hold a hearing virtually. And so that is provided for expressly in all of the major institutional rules. And since the pandemic, lots of um, guidance and guidelines have come out, all agreeing that um, it is proper to hold a remote hearing. We've had great success uh, holding hearings remotely, and there are lots of cost savings that are achieved. Uh, and the general international trend is to enforce awards that resulted from a remote or virtual hearing. Just, just one other point, Hank. Also, uh, certain seat, uh, juridical seats, the the procedural law sometimes might not let you do that. So there's certain Middle Eastern seat, seats, for example, Doha, Qatar, where ultimately, you even if if the seat is Doha, Qatar, you might have enforceability issues if you 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 elect to hold the hearing outside of uh, outside of that country or, or, or the seat. But I don't. I I think those are there's very few of them. But uh, I, I flagged that because I recently had that on a case. Yeah, but that's good to know. I think that's an indication that that's the seat that one should not choose. <laughs> uh, good seats of arbitration should absolutely allow you flexibility to hold your hearings uh, elsewhere. So I would not recommend the locations that Zelda just uh, pointed out. Um, okay, we're on to the last necessary element uh, in an arbitration clause, and that is to specify the language of the arbitration. <clears throat> if you don't specify it, you, you, will, you can still have an effective arbitration, but it is really something that we highly recommend, because if the language of the arbitration isn't specified and the contract and the dispute is between parties from different jurisdictions with different languages, one doesn't even know in which language to initiate the arbitration because it's unclear. Um, and so it, it is really critical to specify it in the arbitration clause. The majority, the vast majority of arbitrations that are international uh, are in English, uh, I would say 90%. There's some arbitration in Spanish internationally, but it's a very distant second. Really, the vast majority is in English. Um, but if your contract is more regional and the, the parties speak the same language, of course, you can perfectly have an arbitration in, in another language, uh, including French. Um, relevant factors are, you know, what language do the parties speak? What is the language of the contract? What is the uh, language of the likely witnesses? And another important question is the pool of qualified arbitrators and counsel. Of course, if you choose English, uh, most arbitrators and counsel do speak English. If you choose a different language, you may be very limiting the pool of arbitrators very significantly. And again, that may be okay for a local dispute, for, but for any dispute where there's a cross-border element, that's not advisable. We also do not advise providing for more than one language of the arbitration. Parties may think, well, I speak English, you speak French, let's do a bilingual arbitration. Those are very complex and costly and unnecessarily so. So we highly advise not to do that. Uh, you may uh, agree that certain documents don't need to be translated, but we do not recommend uh, bilingual arbitration generally. 
and then we can go on to what I think maybe my last slide. So here I've just listed other um, items that you may need to want to put in your clause. We do see them. Uh, sometimes they are necessary like as Jennifer mentioned, where the arbitration rules don't provide for confidentiality and you want it, you do need to put it in the clause. Or if you have a multi-contract situation or a multi-party situation, you may need to provide um, for that in your arbitration clauses to make sure that you can have a dispute involving all contracts and all parties before one um, tribunal. Um, but there's several others that are often not necessary. One I can point out is uh, top right, arbitrator nationality and qualifications. We see that very, we see that in clauses. We typically do not recommend specifying any nationality or qualifications. Again, by doing that, you're limiting the pool of available arbitrators. And very often you don't know when you enter into the contract what type of qualification you actually want in an arbitrator. You may think, oh, this is a construction uh, project. I want an arbitrator qualified in construction. Well, maybe you may have a type of dispute where you actually would benefit from an arbitrator who is not that knowledgeable about construction. And so you don't want to specify that in advance so that you have maximum flexibility when a dispute arises. Uh, and then one other example of a provision that we often see is provisions on interim measures. Um, those are not necessary. Typically the arbitration law provides that both the courts and the arbitrators have the power to grant interim relief. And so do the typically the applicable arbitration rules. So it's provided for, you will have an opportunity to get interim measures. And if you try to specify it in the clause, very often we see that done in using language that actually causes confusion uh, and make, make it more difficult to get interim leave than if you didn't provide for it at all. And with that, I will end uh, uh, my presentation. Uh, happy to answer any questions uh, later on. I, so I guess that that's over to me then. Um, yes, Zelda. Yes, sorry. Perfect. So um, today I'm going to be dress, addressing uh, diversity in uh, in international arbitration, um, and I thought that I would start with a uh, with a quote from Thomas Schultz, who is currently the um, the professor of international arbitration at the University of Geneva, which is my uh, my adopted hometown. In his, in his paper entitled The Ethos of Arbitration, he starts by asking the reader to imagine two groups of people. The first group is composed of a, a colorful patch, patchwork of individuals, some young, some old, some from the left, some from the right, some wild, some tame, some solar soul, some cultivating friendships, some warmth, some pursuing individuality and jealousy, some free, some revering Calvinism, which uh, is pretty typical for Geneva, but uh, others macho, others tiptoeing angels, some male, some female, and some unclear, some enjoying this very text and some already hating it for its decorousness in the legal academy. The second group is composed of almost exclusively white men aged 50 to 70 properly and somewhat strictly educated in European or North American universities, more possessive than generous, overworked and quite unhappy, rather disillusioned, all dark suits and somber ties, intellectually somewhat insecure, socially somewhat haughty. Importantly, individuals in both groups have the same average legal profession, proficiency. Now imagine you're an individual who have a, has a dispute with another person, this dispute bothers you greatly. It's the first thing that comes to your mind when you wake up every day. It matters to you. One of the two groups, as a group, will decide on the outcome of your dispute. And the question he asks is, which one do you choose? Now, I don't intend to go on, but before embarking on the meat of the discussion, Professor Schultz says, 
to the reader, now switch your hats. And he asks you to do this twice. In addition to which one would you choose, he asks, which one does a society choose? And then he goes on to ask, which one does a company choose? Now, as we know, and as Jennifer has uh, very well addressed in her presentation today, arbitration exists by agreement. In addition, the most coveted aspect of, of arbitration is probably party autonomy. The parties get to choose. Thus the chooser, and I'm, I'm hearing here, I'm referring here to the choice of diversity in arbitration, is the user. So using Professor Schultz's imaginary dispute, do you, does a society, or even a company as the user of arbitration make different choices in respect of diversity? when it comes to picking counsel or an arbitrator. Now, with that introduction, I want to touch on two topics today. The first is the current answer to that series of questions. Are the choices being made representative of a diverse arbitration community? And the second, taking as a starting basis that it's a no-brainer that a more diverse group has better thinking qualities and produces better outputs. But what can be done to make arbitration and the community more diverse? So turning to the first part, where are we in terms of diversity? Diversity, of course, is a broad topic. Given the audience today, I think it makes sense focusing on gender diversity. I'm going to touch upon diversity more generally, not necessarily focused on East Africa, because I know Aisha is going to pick up on some of the regional statistics in her presentation. Now, for 2021, the LCIA or the London Court of International Arbitration reported that 47% of all LCIA appointments were women. Now that's slightly up from 2020 where the number was 45. Now what's quite telling here is 16% of those appointments were women, but only from the parties. So where you've got the court, the LCIA court, so the institution, appointing 47% women. In fact, the parties are only choosing uh, women 16% of the time. Now, if you turn to the ICC, for 2021, 40% were, again, just focusing on women, 40% were nominated or appointed by the court. And that's up from 2020, where, where, where the figures were 37. And again, you see the same trend, but only 17.5% were party appointments. You can, go, you can go through every single institution, SIAC, the Singaporean International Arbitration Center. You've ultimately got here 46.2% of the nominations by the court were, um, were women. Uh, that's for 2022, whereas 2021, uh, the, the, the figure was 35.8%. Turning to the Swiss Arbitration Center, and, and similar to, to, to SIAC, SIAC doesn't report on party uh, um, nominations or appointments. Uh, the Swiss Arbitration Center is, is similar in that respect. It only reports on, um, on court appointments. For 2021, the Swiss Arbitration Center appointed 77% of all court appointments were women, and that's up from 71% uh, in 2020 but only 20% of all Swiss cases were actually court appointments. So it gives, it gives you the small pool, in fact, that we're talking about. Now, closer to my native home, I thought I would include some statistics from the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa, but there are not many that are publicly available. What, one thing that I can say though, um, having been uh, in, in touch with the registrar directly is for 2022, AFSA now has 151 arbitrators on the AFSA panel. And of that, 19% are women. Now that is not nominations, that's not appointments, but it shows you that AFSA is trying to make an effort to give more visibility to women. Now, turning to the second part of my discussion, what more can be done? The two immediate points that come to mind, First, a point that flows naturally from what we've just been discussing, transparency is key. 
Without transparency, the figures can be massaged in any fashion. We also need to, to ensure that the reporting is done in a consistent fashion. It is of little use to compare institutional appointments, as I've just shown you, with, with party appointments. These figures should be reported separately to allow us to see what progress is indeed being made. It's also important to report in numbers and percentages because a high percentage might not always be representative of the number of women actually being import, uh, appointed. So second, I think our initiatives and our energy also need to be focused on the right players. In other words, the users. Here, I think there's merit in thinking of this in terms of two categories. One, women as arbitration counsel, and two, women as arbitrators. Now, turning to in-house lawyers, or let's say external counseling, counsel advising in-house lawyers as the users. In-house lawyers obviously have a key swing vote effect on encouraging diversity when it comes to both the appointment of counsel as well as the appointment of arbitrators. So efforts should therefore be made with in-house lawyers, counsel, to in-house lawyers to consider more diverse candidates. The starting basis, of course, has to be that all candidates are equally qualified. I have to say, when I, I look around me today, I see a lot of highly qualified and talented, talented women lawyers. So it's simply not an issue. From there, for every man, a woman candidate should also be put in for consideration. The outcome might, might not change immediately, but slowly by seeing more and more women candidates, with equal qualifications, we may just achieve, achieve more quality. I also have a practical suggestion for those in-house lawyers where they receive pushback from business because there's a risk or probably more accurately a perceived risk of taking a chance on a more diverse candidate. There may be fertile ground for the appointment of a more diverse or shall we say a newbie mm -hmm. candidate when representing a respondent. Why? For the simple reason that the claimant has already appointed its arbitrator and an assessment as to gravitas of the claimant's candidate and the newbie can then, can then be, be made. So when respondent or counsel for a respondent, I think it makes sense taking a calculated pause and truly reflecting on the talent pool, educating yourselves as to potential candidates if need be, of course, this idea is no means an endorsement not to promote diversity in all appointments. I'm merely proposing a practical solution to counter the gravitas fear that's often associated with how newer candidates fare when they're sitting on a panel with more established arbitrators. Now, as for external counsel, look around. My suggestion here is a simple one. Put forward a woman when you're next asked by your client for a recommendation. Given that we are part of this community of women, we're best placed to start making a positive change. As for the institutions, as the users, to be frank, the institutions have played a key role when it comes to the appointment of arbitrators. They're leading the pack. There's a responsibility therefore on our part as women, when we receive an arbitration appointment, don't let the institutions down. The criticisms we resoundingly hear of too busy, too old, should also ring in our ears. Finally, I don't really intend to, uh, to discuss tips to develop a successful practice in any detail. Um, and I'll rather encourage those in the audience and my panelists to share their views when we get to the Q&A, as I, I feel it's something that is quite personal. There's no one fits all solution, but I will say, I think my one top tip is this, master your own law, be a good lawyer. I see so many interns who enroll in LLM after LLM in arbitration, but during their internship, it just becomes so apparent that they never mastered their own law. And arbitration, of course, it's a form of dispute resolution. Of course, it's become a practice, but arbitration, in fact, is a procedure that can be learned through practice. So with that, um, I, I've tried to shorten it a bit because I know we are a little bit uh, short of time, but I, I'll stop there um, and pass over to Aisha.
Um, thank you, Zelda. I, I think there's very little for me to add. You give a very nice uh, roundup of some of the challenges. Um, I would just say that uh, in my view, um, there hasn't been a lot of meaningful progress in international arbitration. Even if we look at the domestic scene, which is quite active in a number of East African countries, we are still seeing um, probably the same small group of arbitrators with a few women being appointed time and again. And there, I would say that diversity would incorporate an age element. So what happens is the same experienced practitioners are appointed over and over, and it's very hard to uh, be selected without prior experience. So I think diversity, like you said, is much wider. It includes um, age. It includes a number of other factors. Um, I think the challenges to addressing it are still significant. Um, and I think that although some measures have been made, some of these are token measures, um, a bit like signing up to an ESG pledge. Easy to say, much, much harder to do effectively. Um, and I think the other thing is to ask ourselves why African governments and African parties are not themselves appointing more African practitioners. Because I think that if we ourselves don't have faith um, in each other, then it's very hard to complain that institutions located very far away from us are not appointing us. So I think I think we have to start with our own um, regional centers and our local centers and ask them why they are not promoting um, local practitioners more and maybe diversifying their pool away from the older, more experienced um, practitioners. So that's all I'd like to say on that. I think because of um, time, I'd like to move on to trends, please. Um, trends in, in commercial arbitration. Um, I'm not necessarily going to limit this to East Africa. I think some of the trends are continent-wide and they're worth talking about. The first thing I want to mention is the, um, the push towards increasing the use of mediation. I think there has been a lot of discussion globally around the advantages that mediation has over, for example, arbitration um, in terms of cost savings, um, accessibility, it's less elitist. There are many reasons why uh, it makes sense to include a tiered clause in your dispute resolution um, uh, agreement. So I think, I think there has been a recognition, particularly for African states, that simply um, adopting a standard form international arbitration clause is not necessarily the best fit. And actually uh, looking towards promoting mediation makes a lot of sense and could save a lot of time and money. Um, so we have this uh, issue, which is that the New York Convention is very well established. It's probably the most successful international treaty um, in terms of coverage around the world, and we don't have the same for mediation. And although we would say that mediation agreements do tend to be enforced and upheld because they are voluntary in nature, it would still be useful to have a cross-border framework. So we have the Singapore Convention on Mediation. Um, in terms of East Africa signatories, we only have Rwanda and Uganda. Um, I recently asked why Kenya was not a signatory because our government has made a big push towards um, mediation. Um, but I understand that we're in discussions about um, reservations. There are two available reservations. One is between mediations involving governmental parties, um, and there is a second uh, reservation which um, isn't coming to mind immediately. But I think there is a lot of potential for this convention to do well in Africa. Ghana has been the most recent signatory. Um, and a lot of developing countries are embracing mediation. And they do want a cross-border framework for um, enforcing these awards. And I think it makes a lot of sense. So I would say that's the first trend I'm seeing is the push towards uh, mediation before looking at arbitration. 
Um, we are seeing this enacted also in national policy. So in Kenya, um, the cabinet has recently approved a draft national ADR policy. This is going to be put forward to parliament and to public consultation. Now, this um, national ADR policy has very far reaching implications. Um, for commercial arbitration and other forms of dispute resolution. The first thing it's going to do is make sweeping changes to our Arbitration Act of 1995, which is quite well established. Um, for example, the plan is to um, create a dispute resolution act. So to have one central act that under it is an umbrella that would cover arbitration, mediation, conciliation, and other ADR um, forms, particularly because mediation doesn't have an actual legislative framework in Kenya. Um, and because of what I said earlier about the push towards using mediation. The other changes would be to remove from the high court the limited intervention in arbitration cases to remove those powers from the high court to a newly created arbitration court. Um, the idea is to speed up recognition and enforcement and to have much more consistency in decision-making by having a specialized court that only deals with arbitration. Um, and I think this would be in many ways very welcomed uh, by the profession because I must say that our high court is extremely busy, and those of us in the commercial division um, are trying to get our re uh, awards recognized and enforced, but we are facing a severe backlog in case management. Um, the other thing it's going to do is um, create codes of conduct. So there's a concern that, for example, um, there isn't the degree of supervision that the high court has over practicing advocates, over people like mediators and arbitrators, who in many cases will not be legally qualified and won't necessarily be regulated by the high court. Um, so there is this idea of, of having standardization of ethics and standardizations of codes of conduct. So there's a lot in this national ADR policy I understand Nigeria is also looking at um, a national ADR policy, and, and I think this is something that a lot of countries will need to be doing as they look at where arbitration fits in terms of its overall um, position, in terms of dispute resolution, and whether it fits the, the strategic objectives of that specific country. Um, the other trend I wanted to talk about was the there is in some countries a push to nationalize disputes. So across Africa, there is a, a recognition by the African Union that it would help African states if they could repatriate disputes to the continent. And this is seen in a number of, of ways, and it does affect commercial arbitration. Um, so one of the measures is the increasing acceptance that disputes concerning national resources, natural resources, um, must be subject to national laws. I think that one is quite well understood and less controversial, but more controversially, some countries like Tanzania are saying should be resolved in those countries. That doesn't mean that they have to be litigated. They can allow for arbitration, but for example, in Tanzania, following the amendments that came in 2020, under the new um, Tanzania Amendment Act, um, where you have uh, an international center, for example, the LCIA, uh, administering an, a dispute under a contract, um, if that contract concerns natural resources, then that is only effective insofar as there's Tanzania national law applies and that the venue of the hearing must be in Tanzania. Um, so, so that's that's actually a, a compromise because the previous position was that the seat had to be in Tanzania. Now they've said you can choose other um, non-Tanzania centers, but you must have the venue in Tanzania. Um, so that's an interesting one. Not all countries are adopting this approach, but I think when it's 
when we come to look at um, natural resources, there is a lot of politicization around dispute resolution. And this discourse is happening at a continent-wide level, and it will have an impact. And that's why I mentioned people who are reviewing their national policies and looking at what they think best suits them. And natural resources is one of those very emotional, emotive subjects uh, for Africans. We all love our land. And we do think that some of um, some of the power that has been contracted away needs to be reclaimed by, by national states. So I thought that was just interesting to mention. One thing we did see um, over COVID was that a lot of the um, regional centers updated their rules to allow for the use of virtual hearings and increased use of technology. So we found that across the board, including with the NCIA, um, we had um, essentially the uptake of, for the very first time, the idea of electronic filing and um, subject to parties agreements, the idea that you could dispense with physical hearings altogether. And I think that now that we've come through COVID, this, these type of amendments and updates are going to be increasingly used in certain types of disputes. Um, finally, I wanted to talk about um, some of the continent-wide um, initiatives. One thing I would say is that we have too many centers in Africa. I think we recognize that 75 is too many for a continent of 54 states. Um, what can we do? Uh, I think the idea is that these regional centers are supposed to collaborate and not to compete. Um, so they look towards their own immediate neighbors and see how they can service them. Um, in a collaborative manner. So I don't think they would be necessarily seeing themselves as competitors. Um, there is a push to raising standards because obviously if the governments are saying we need to repatriate disputes, we need to increase the confidence that people will place in these centers. That's done in a number of ways, having um, a very good um, list of, 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 of arbitrators, very good list of mediators, but also looking at our rules. Um, Jennifer and, and Ank had mentioned the importance of looking at the institutional rules. Are they modern? Are they fit for purpose? Do they allow for flexibility? For example, do they allow for emergency arbitrator appointments and things like confidentiality? So I would say a number of the centers have updated their rules and are actually positioning themselves um, quite well. The other thing we're seeing across the continent, um, and I see this with centers like AFSA and with the NCIA, is that um, arbitration follows investment. And one of the main countries investing in Africa is China. So what China has done very well is um, simultaneously with investing in a country, it has created these um, relationships and partnerships with Chinese centers, um, which, you know, actually are as astonished at how many they have. But for example, uh, the NCIA and AFSA have um, MOUs with KJAC and um, um, essentially um, some form of cooperation with Chinese centers. I think this is very interesting um, that African countries are looking um, increasingly as a compromise to using non-Western institutions. So moving away from New York, Geneva, Paris, and London, and we will see, for example, that in Kenya, parties are very happy to consider the use of, um, we used to use DIFC before when it existed, but we're quite happy to consider Asian and Middle Eastern centers as a compromise, particularly where we have non-African parties. and. I think there's just much more choice these days than they used to be in the past. So you don't have to, you know, there isn't this idea that if you don't choose Paris, you get this substandard service. Actually, there's a lot more choice and there are a lot of competent, very reputable institutions that don't sit in Western countries. And I can tell you from my clients that when it comes to cost savings, um, visa issues, how easy is it to get to, um, if, if is there a perception of bias, these centers are actually coming up quite well. And I see that the increased interest between Asian countries investing in Africa would only 
increase this trend. So what I'm thinking is that there's going to be stiff competition for people like the ICC and the LCIA, to be honest, because there is a lot more choice than we used to face in Africa. And I just thought that was a very interesting thing to end on. And I'm very happy now to hand it back for um, Q&A. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much for that great session. Uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer. Thank you, Ank. Thank you, Zelda. Thank you, Aisha, for sharing your insights and expertise. So on to our Q&A session. Um, several questions were answered in course of the presentation. We just have a number of them. Um, and I'll read one from Ari Naitwe. How are ethical standards among arbitrators kept in ICC? I'll invite any of the panelists to respond to that. So I'm, I'm happy to take a, a first crack at this because I did some work in this area. Um, the, the main mechanism for ethical standards in international arbitration is what I'll call soft law. There are various guidelines that have been published by the arbitration community that deal with um, ethics and professional obligations. So there is the IBA, the International Bar Association has published guidelines on conflicts of interest. Uh, the project that I worked on um, with ICA was guidelines on standards of practice or civility in international arbitration. So there's a matrix of soft law standards, including specific ones that apply to the ethics of arbitrators. And then on top of that, of course, uh, each practitioner brings with them their own national rules of professional conduct. And that is sort of the minimum threshold. One is still required to um, abide by whatever your ethical obligations are in the jurisdiction where you are barred. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, any of the panelists would wish to add something to that? I mean, just the, the ICC rules themselves have a standard that arbitrators have to be uh, impartial and independent. So that is the, the crux of the ethical uh, obligation in the ICC rules themselves, uh, in addition to everything Jennifer said. <clears throat> Thank you, Ank. Um, next, um, we have a comment from Kennedy Othiambo. It reads, in a Malaysia case, an arbitrator changed the seat from Spain to Paris when a Spanish court held that he had no jurisdiction to arbitrate the matter. This appears to me to have been an abuse of process by the arbitrator by changing the seat midstream. I'll invite our panelists to comment on that. Yeah, I, I saw the comment. It's a little difficult to comment on this without knowing a little bit more about the specific circumstances. Uh, if the seat of the arbitration was specified in the arbitration clause, an arbitrator has no power to change the seat of the arbitration. So it, it, if that's really what the arbitrator tried to do, um, I would hope that the courts of uh, where the arbitration was moved uh, would find that way and I would think so. But again, I, I think we would need to know a little bit more about what actually happened to, to comment meaningfully. If it is as described, yes, I would agree. It is an abuse. Thank you, Ank. Uh, we'll try to reach out to Kennedy to, uh, to see the possibility of uh, having him maybe to expound more on the details. In the meantime, I'll move on to our next question from Belmont Durandal, it reads, does the drafting of a pathological arbitration clause engage the responsibility of the drafter of the contract? How to remedy this if a party does not want to sign an arbitration agreement? Over I, to you, Zelda, I see you already unmuted. I, I can take that. I, I, I think ultimately, Arbitration is by agreement. So if someone doesn't want to sign the arbitration agreement, I think you've probably got your answer there. In terms of ultimately uh, whether whether a clause, clause is pathological and, and it uh, attracts any form of liability, well, I, I guess that would probably be a, a question for the drafter vis-a-vis -vis their client. It, it might ultimately at the end of the, uh, of the day delay the arbitration proceedings or ultimately end up uh, you know, years later 
um, yeah, uh, th that you couldn't get the procedure on track when you needed to. I think it's quite a quite a difficult one to 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 deal with because sometimes you're dealing with pathological clauses at the enforcement stage, um, which which obviously is a little bit uh, a little bit more tricky. If you, if you're dealing with it at the gateway, that ultimately you just didn't specify uh, certain aspects, which you can then reach an, an agreement later. Well, you might be able to remedy it, but usually when a dispute has already arisen, um, pe people aren't always wanting to agree. Thank you, Zelda. Um, in addition to Kennedy's question, I, there's one more comment. Um, is the seat cast in stone? Yes, so that, that is further to my comment. So yes, if the parties have agreed to the seat of arbitration, that is the seat of the arbitration. The arbitrator cannot change the seat of the arbitration without the consent of the parties. Now, there are one wrinkle on that is there are sometimes clauses that don't clearly specify what the seat is, right? So I saw a clause recently that referred to, you know, arbitration in a certain county of New York that didn't exist. And so there was a question of interpretation, right? How does one interpret that clause to be effective? And, and what should we reasonably understand the, the seat to mean? But if there is a seat selection, it needs to be applied subject to interpretation as necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Ang. Um, the next one from Elaine. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I'll not be able to read that. Um, maybe I'll invite any of our panelists who is good at French to take it, that it's question. It's just a comment, Glory. It, it's a thank you, Glory. So oh, thank, oh thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's another one. Hi, Aisha. How would you advise a young Kenyan advocate if they want to start out in international commercial arbitration? Some practical things one can do. Hi, um, okay. So I think the first thing to say is that I don't encourage people to do these expensive LLM courses in arbitration. I think they're money makers and often swindling poor young um, uh, aspiring lawyers. So I, I wouldn't say go off and do an LLM. I think what's important is to see if you can get um, any sort of experience either, for example, at a center. So there are centers like NCIA that are looking to create um, mentorship programs, but also um, courses for people who want to train as arbitral secretaries, because if you act as a, a, a secretary to an arbitral tribunal, you get a lot of inside exposure into the procedures, the arguments, the way things are done, and you get to meet some of um, some important players. So I think, I think getting some practical experience like that um, early on is important. Number one, because it, it makes you really realize that it might not be as um, sexy and attractive as you think from the outside. I mean, it's, I, I think it's often presented as this super glamorous specialism and it's actually a lot of hard work and, and there's a lot less traveling than people think now after COVID. And there may be some things you like and other things you need to reconsider. Um, number two, it will give you an idea of um, how much competition there is. There's an enormous amount of competition um, in, in particularly in international arbitration, but even just in the domestic scene. You also need to become a member of um, one of the um, local institutions like Chartered Institute, and you need to start doing the courses because they have a commitment that if you reach a certain level of qualification, they will try and give you experience, which is what you need on your CV to encourage other people to use you. So I think these are the three things I would say are important. Um, don't do an LLM, try and uh, network and get some work experience join a reputable body and start doing some courses and um, use that to network as well and number three assess why you think this is the path for you um i know a lot of people who are actually um busy uh arbitrators but they also do many other things um so one of my friends was saying that as much as she's appointed as an arbitrator she also does a lot of other things including business and human rights um, advice. So I think there's maybe a perception that there's more work in this available than there may be. Thank you. 
Lord, Thank Lord, you. Lori, if, if you don't mind, may, may I comment uh, a little bit further? I, I do want to address the LLM comment. I agree with Aisha that an LLM is not a guarantee to a, a career in arbitration at all. Um, but it may be uh, a useful path into it. I mean, I myself am from Belgium. I did an LLM in New York. I then started working in international arbitration at White and & Case, and here I am. Um, I would not have gone into this field and be where I am without my LLM. Uh, but I do agree, it's not, it's not a guarantee if you do an LLM, you're going to go into this career. There are many people who do an LLM and many who want to work in arbitration and who are not able to because the, the, the people who want to work in arbitration are more numerous than are, are required, I think. So it's an important ammunition, but I would put it in a little bit more qualified manner than Aisha did. I can give another example. We have an associate from Nigeria in our arbitration group in Paris who did an LLM uh, in the United States. And I don't think he would have gotten to our Paris office without that LLM. And I can give many other examples. In fact, most of our partners in our arbitration group in New York have done an LLM and that's the way they got into the into the field. So I think it's a little bit more nuanced, although I, I do agree, Aisha, it's very important to make clear that an LLM is not a guaranteed path to a career in international arbitration in particular because it is so expensive. I, I did want to make a few other comments just from my perspective, you know, again, uh, today sitting a fair amount as an arbitrator. I and want to echo a few of the things that have been said. I think uh, appointing people as counsel or arbitrator is all about trust, right? It's about trusting the person that you appoint. And to be able to trust someone, you have to know someone. And so networking, I think, is incredibly important. Knowing people, making yourself known to people, make people know how you think. Make people see your quality. I think that's another key point. Whatever I do, I try to do to the best of my ability, whatever it is. Because I think in particular, if you come at this when you're younger or when you're a woman or when you're um, of another type of diversity, you will be judged at a higher standard. And that may, that's unfortunate, but it is what it is. And so I think showing quality in everything that you do uh, is key. And so volunteering in an organization, writing something, publishing an article, showing in some way who you are and how good you are, I think is absolutely critical. So if you're asked to do something, work hard. Um, and in the beginning, you have to work hard. Once you get the appointments, they keep rolling in. It's the first one that's the key one. I got my first one when I was 34. I was appointed by the ICC in a terrible case. I was a sole arbitrator. The respondent defaulted. Uh, I was threatened with all kinds of things and it was very nerve wracking, uh, but I, I got it done. I did my award and, and, and I think the, that's why the ICC appointed me again. I wasn't swayed by this, I just did it. Uh, and so whatever you get to do, whatever little piece it is to, to do it well and to show quality, I think this is, this is a marathon, not a sprint, and it's something that one has to, to build on. And then I do agree also on the, we have to think about each other. I do think about women all the time, when I can make appointments, when I can ask somebody to speak, when I can, I always think about giving an opportunity to a woman. I think it's very important in, in any of this that we, that, we, that we have this front of mind. As Aisha said, if we don't appoint each other, why would we want somebody else to appoint us? We have to work at it together. Um, and one final comment I'll make in, in that same vein is in New York, when I started, there was barely a woman in international arbitration. Today, we are like 50. And it is because we've been so supportive. We have, I've been to arbitration events since I was, since I started in the field when I was 25. I know so many women now for 25 years. And, and, and again, it's a marathon and it's building. And these women are going places, you are going places and you can help each other. And you can, re I can really see over the course of my career, how today I'm getting many opportunities because of relationships that I created 25 years ago when it was very unclear where they would go and where I would go. Uh, but that today are such natural relationships that are much difficult, more difficult to create 
today. It's because I've had them for so long that there's a relationship of trust now. These are these are my quick tips. I'm coming from that aspect. Thank you very much, Ank. Um, I'm taking note we are almost out of time, but um, uh, Hunter, I think you can take the next comment from Alain, then you can also, we can now start the round of concluding remarks, and then we can sum it up. Zelda, did you wanna? No, I, I actually just wanted to, because I feel like I might have started the LLM thing, but I just wanted to say, because I think it's relevant for this audience that, you know, Ang's entirely right that it is an access point. And I think there's there's two things. It's either the platform you can practice in or it's the knowledge that you need to gain to be able to practice. And I think you need to almost look at it in, 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 those, in those aspects. For example, I'm sitting in Geneva where the MIDS, the Graduate Institute, has a very well-known international arbitration LLM. And there are a lot of African, Indian, Asian uh, candidates who are granted by the Swiss government a two-year visa to get experience after their LLM within uh, the uh, within the, fir the the law firms. So, you know, where you have a visa issue, they tag on ultimately granting you the, the work experience. Obviously, it's done on merit and you have to apply. But there's some of these these LLMs that give you access to a market that maybe ordinarily, you know, I, I have African nationality. I know how difficult it is to come to Europe. So ultimately, the, there are these gateways that you, you can take advantage of. One, one last point I'll mention is that young in, institutions, whether it be ICA, whether it be uh, uh, the LCIA, you know, you've got a lot of these um young organizations associated with the institutions or, or, or just existing on their own. And, and some of these even have scholarships to go to some of these universities. And, and for the purpose of this audience, young AFSA, I, I'm in the process of setting it up with a young group of Southern African practitioners. And there's a lot of excitement for that. So, uh, you know, you, you might be thinking about something similar in East Africa, but ultimately, as, as Ang said, it's all about those relationships you cultivate when you're a young practitioner that takes you through to, 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 to a, a more elderly one. Thank you. Thank you, Hunter. Um, there's a comment from Ali. You may want to take that. There's a question about what are the different approaches to the execution of a, uh, an arbitral award? And then it says, I speak about territorial approach and this location approach. Um, I, not, it, it may be, I don't know whether this question is about enforcing an award that has been annulled at the place of arbitration. Uh, it seems like it may be about that. Just very quickly. So, um, when an award is annulled at the place of arbitration, most countries will consider that that award is gone and they can no longer enforce that award because it's become a nullity at the place of arbitration. There are a few court jurisdictions in the world where the principle is different. France is the most notable jurisdiction. In France, an award is considered a, a national instrument and it's considered that the place of arbitration has not a stronger say about the fate of the award than any other country. So if you have an arbitration seated in Nairobi and the award gets annulled at the seat of arbitration, when you bring that award to France to enforcement, the French courts may actually enforce it and say, we don't care what the Nairobi court said about this. To us, this is a valid award. We're going to enforce it. Most other countries in the world will take the approach. If it was annulled at the seat in Nairobi, we are not going to enforce it. There's one exception to that in the US when it's found that the courts at the place of arbitration were corrupt in some way or really egregious in the annulment of the award then they may still enforce the award, but that's a very high standard. Typically, if it's annulled at the place of arbitration, you're not going to be able to enforce it in most other countries in the world. Thank you very much, Ang. Um, we are towards uh, finalizing our session, uh, but I'll invite our speakers each around of one minute um, to offer their concluding remarks. Then um, I'll hand over to uh, Angela to close the webinar. We can start with the order of presentation. 
Jennifer? Sure. Thank you, Glory. Um, it's been comprehensive, so I, I will keep it brief and, and add a comment on our on our last discussion on how to increase diversity and develop a career in arbitration. I think one point that was not directly covered um, and relates to networking is profile raising and ensuring as a young practitioner that you are given opportunities to raise your profile within the context of an arbitration that you may be working on if you are on a council team and working as party advocate. So making sure that um, you have opportunities to stand up and to do oral argument so that the tribunal and opposing counsel are seeing you in action. Uh, mandates do come in sometimes because a client may see you on the other side of the table and be impressed by your advocacy skills and when the next dispute comes up, uh, we'll give you a call. So push for yourself within a team to make sure that you're getting those opportunities. And there's also opportunities at the arbitral institutions at the regional level to um, input rules to enhance profile raising. So there's some examples in the US, for example, of rules that explicitly authorize a tribunal to give an opportunity um, to young practitioners to stand up at a hearing. And that often helps to facilitate clients who may be nervous about having a more junior person speak up if the arbitral tribunal encourages that. So ensuring that you're getting profile raising opportunities within the arbitration itself. And thank you again for the opportunity to, to speak today. Ank? Yes, uh, same as Jennifer, I feel it was very comprehensive. And so I, I don't want to take more time. I realize we are over time. I, I just would like to thank everyone for the for their attendance, for the great questions. And, uh, and um, we're available also after the webinar. I'd like to say if you have any questions, you can certainly look us up and we would be happy to continue the conversation. Thank you. Ank, maybe we want to take a little more time and comment on uh, Kennedy's question. I recently qualified with an LLM in IC and I'm trying to gain some experience in Geneva. Any hints? Let, let, I will let, leave that one to Zelda because uh, she's based in okay. Geneva. <laughs> As my concluding remark, I'll, I'll answer Kennedy's question. I, I think it goes to, to anything. Like at the end of the day, if you want experience, you need to apply. So uh, ultimately look at all of the, uh, if it's experience in Geneva and I don't know where you're based, ultimately send applications to all the law firms. You've got a lot of the big Swiss law firms, but you've also got international law firms. I think ultimately at the end of the day, we, we get a number, of, uh, a number of applications, but you know, a, lot, a lot of it, when you, when you look at an LLM, if you've got good grades, uh, well, you, you've got a good enough chance. So I think that's your starting point is just get yourself out there. There's also in Geneva, a lot of social events for for um for arbitration practitioners and a lot of the students so again if you're based in geneva they have drinks once a month you have a, a, a number of initiatives um again you can drop me an email after this if you are based in geneva and i can link you into to to those groups thank you hunter last but not least aisha hi um no i just wanted to say two things one some of the questions have um highlighted an aspect we haven't mentioned, which is language skills. One of the ways to improve your chances of um, a career in international arbitration is developing other languages. And I think it's frequently overlooked. So I, I would say that as Kenyans, we need to really embrace other languages um, uh, because I think we're, we're, we're slightly too tied to English. Um, and the world is making it easy for us to forget that other languages are very important um, in world trade. Um, the second point I wanted to make is I think that we should support our, um, our own African institutions um, and they, they will help us um, uh, raise our profile. So if you can become a member of the African Arbitration Association and you can volunteer to undertake certain initiatives, they're always asking people to volunteer to update rules or come up with new codes of conduct. And this gives you an opportunity to get to know people from other parts of the world and raise your own personal profile. So I think it's it's a, it's a win-win for the African institution and also for the person who's volunteering. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aisha. Um, from my side, um, think, I want to take this opportunity to thank the East Africa Law Society for this partnership. Then uh, to our speakers once again, thank you very much for such an elaborate and uh, a very, it was, it was a well-organized webinar. 
we thank you for the time that, that you've taken to prepare for this. Um, at that juncture, I will invite um, Angela. Angela, as you conclude, there's one comment from Teles4 on uh, certificates. Maybe we want to address that as you end the webinar. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Glory, and our panel of very eminent arbitrators uh, all over the world. Um, as uh, our first speaker stated, you know, when we talk about international arbitration and trying to cram um, that whole um, huge, huge um, topic, I mean, there are whole LLMs that are done purely on international arbitration. So I think our speakers did a very good job. Um, let me tell you members, it was very hard for them to figure out what not to say because everything is very important, but I think they did a very good job in just giving us the highlights. You know, this was just an appetizer and uh, they have really piqued our interest in matters in uh, international arbitration. Um, thank you very much for your time and um, for the members who have stayed uh, till the end, um, courtesy of this partnership, there will be a certificate of participation. So um, you can tell everyone that you have attended a session on introduction to um, international arbitration. I think if you listened to Glory as she was reading the profiles, of our speakers and by the way these were just very brief profiles um i think we can say if you quote anywhere that you um the introduction was given by the by Ang stevens or by aisha zelda or jennifer i mean it will be recognized so with that i want to thank all of you for your patience uh, and for persevering to the end so for those ones who didn't stay until the end well they you can tell your friends whom you know they joined then they logged off that they missed an opportunity um, to get a certificate but with that kindly members uh, look out for the next uh, series because there will be something very exciting for our members um, courtesy of ISLP and the East African uh, Law Society Women Lawyers Committee. So with that, um, we have come to the end of our webinar. Enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of your day for our panelists who are um, just beginning their day. Special shout out to Ank. Um, you have made it despite the early hours, and we are very grateful. So with that, um, we have come to the end of our webinar. Again, look out for the next uh, session that we shall have. Kwaherini, that means goodbye. Thank you.